This is the Nightly Business Report. Good evening, everyone. The law of gravity hit Wall Street today and financial markets around the world, for that matter, as stock prices plunged even more than they did on Black Tuesday of 1929. It was the defining moment of the 1980s. October 19, 1987, the Dow Jones Industrial Average plunged 508 points, the largest single day drop in the history of the stock market. You could just tell people were like, you know, there was guys with their heads down, you know, a few people crying because they'd lost everything. Well, you're thinking, how much lower can it go? It was the only time I've seen fear take over, uh, over greed. I've often said that it was the most frightening moment in my life. There were a near record number of people gathering outside the New York Stock Exchange today to sort of witness history in the making. The world braced itself for another Great Depression, but it was Tuesday, October 20th, that the financial markets came within minutes of a total meltdown. The economic news in the country wasn't particularly good. The dollar was in a little bit of free fall. And so here you were with all of this opportunity for the market to correct. The New York Stock Exchange, the epicenter of the world financial system, was under siege. But the saviors of the markets were on the trading floors in Chicago. the 1980s, America is flush with cash. Riding high on the boon of Reaganomics, displays of wealth are all too conspicuous, and the market is a raging bull. It was an incredible market. We didn't, you have to remember as traders, we couldn't care less why there was a bull run. I mean, you know, the, the Cubs were in the 84 playoffs. There was, you know, the, the city was up for grabs. We were all young. We were the house. We were the casino. Public orders would come in. Uh, they would sell to our bids, they would buy from our offers, and we made money from uh, you know, the space in between. So we all made a lot of money in the early 80s. We were young kids with way too much money. You could always buy puts and calls going way back in history at the stock exchange, but when the CBOE came about, that really created a market for options trading and hedging. To protect a portfolio of Dow stocks that trade in New York, a futures market was created in Chicago. Once they agreed, I knew we could do stock index futures and I convinced um, Standard & Poor's, which was then its own corporation, it was later it was bought by McGraw-Hill. I convinced Standard & Poor's to give us license to um, launch stock indexes and that was launched in 82. The markets were wide, they were good, if you were uh, like anything else, you know, there was, definitely, there was definitely a market to exploit. We were making money because you could kind of drive a truck through the markets and there was a ridiculous amount of order. We called it paper, but there was a ridiculous amount of orders at the time. It's the greed is good, 80s, everything is, you know, uh, money making hand over fist. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Wall Street's Gordon Gecko based on maverick icon Ivan Bosky, harnessed the power of computers to become the most successful trader of the day. What computers have done for the world of trading, at least for the world of retail trading, is really unbelievable. Uh, the, the gap between institutional professional trading and retail trading was huge back in the 80s and even into the early 90s. As late as 1985, on the CBOE and the Pacific Stock Exchange, they would not allow you to have a computer on the floor. But by the mid-1980s, program trading was the dominant trading strategy on Wall Street. The idea was to give institutions and individuals, if they had enough money, a way to uh, hedge a bet, as well as to create a portfolio of stocks in one sort of swift action, if you will, one purchase, one sale. 
By dumping a billion dollars worth of stock into the market with the press of a button, a program trader could single-handedly lower the value of stock. If the stock was part of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the transaction had the potential to move the Dow. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average represents an average price of a basket of stocks. In this particular basket, there are 30 different stocks, and each receives a weight corresponding to its price. So you're just taking the average of these prices for 30 companies. The major market index is a group of 20 stocks that mirror the Dow. They're all very large stocks. You're looking at the IBMs and all the blue chips. This index trades at the Chicago Board of Trade. 17 of the 20 MMI stocks are also part of the Dow. The purchase of those 17 stocks would increase the major market index and could also move the Dow. In the MMI, just go put large buy orders in or large sell orders into 20 stocks and you could affect the change if your orders are big enough. Again, in the long run, the market's always bigger than any participant. But in the short run, you could probably move that index a little bit. On August 25th, 1987, the Dow Jones Industrial Average reached its peak of 2722. Taxes were low. Inflation rate was declining. Contrarians stated the market was overdue for a correction. In the aftermath of the 87 crash, analysts pointed to world events as the culprits. Most traders were not as convinced. This was an era where we still thought news was relevant. When you're standing in the pits back in the day when everything was so busy and active, the markets move before you ever even see the news. So, I mean, we, we would have a news screen all over the pit, but you would never see that. I mean, you could never act fast enough. There's 400 people watching the same bit of news. There may be one order. It's not like you had access to it. Work on it has been the general philosophy for years and years at the stock exchange. I want to acquire a position I've got a month or two weeks or three days, whatever the time frame is. I don't have to buy it all today. And when you hear somebody say, I want to sell it now, it changes something in your mindset. So even if you wanted to close positions out, your only avenue to lay risk off at that time was selling futures. And that's why futures got, I think, a little bit ahead of where the rest of the market was. The fact that people who were trying to implement the portfolio insurance strategies thought that they could sell futures at any time that they wanted. But there wasn't the liquidity, so it was really an illusion of liquidity that caused uh, the 87 crash. The stock market, we are told, is always delivering a message. The only trick is knowing how to read it. This week, the Dow crashed more than 235 points and set a bundle of other nasty all-time records in the process. On Friday, October 16th, less than two months after reaching a record high of 2722, the Dow plummets 108 points, the largest sell-off in U.S. history. The Friday comes, market's going crazy. You gotta remember, I think it was 1984 was the first time we ever had a $50 up day. Now we got a $100 down day. I mean, this is a huge move in the Dow. Oh my Lord, did they know what they were doing? Was there any opportunity to, to liquidate some of the positions so we're not carrying it in over a weekend? And everything is going crazy. They're talking about implosion. It's expiration Friday. On October 16th, expiration Friday was my biggest trading day ever. Biggest, and when I say, I don't mean money that I made. I mean number of contracts that I traded. I got there that morning at 2.30 in the morning, where behind the gates where they first opened for the Seabell, and the doors would open at six o'clock, and then we'd be able to go in at six o'clock and put a card down where we wanted to stand. Put the card down at six o'clock, came back in, never moved the whole day. My Friday was probably the busiest day I ever had in my life as a floor broker. I couldn't breathe, I, had, I was backlogged with orders, 
I was just trying to fill any order I could, the best I could, and move on to the next order. It was, I, I used the expression organized chaos before, that was chaos with no organization. The broker standing next to me at one point had an order, he had one order for 25,000 cheap calls to sell. There was another order I saw, I remember that he had with uh, like like 11,000 calls to sell. I mean, like a ridiculous number. That Friday was to this, you know, uh, through the rest of my career, was the most contracts I had ever traded in one day. I made a lot of money that Friday, but I was more concerned about what was gonna happen for the rest of my life, and I had this bid in for this seat, 260 grand, that was gonna be worthless. I think that day, you know, all of us, that traded in a certain area of the pit, probably traded the most contracts we've ever traded. And I screamed my lungs out. I think I saw pieces of lung fly out. Many investors believe the bottom of the market has finally been hit. They're wrong. We were going to Vegas that Friday night. This is how crazy it was. We're drenched in sweat. We never left the floor. We had our bags packed upstairs. And remember, you're 20, what was it at the time? Maybe 87. So that's 25 years ago. So I'm like not even 30, okay? And I'm sitting there on my way to Vegas. And you're not giving up your trip to Vegas. And then we were, the, the plane was leaving at like six o'clock. And uh, we weren't sure if we should go or not. And then being the people we were at the time, we decided to go. We knew something was going on that weekend that something was bad. And we weren't scheduled to come home till Monday. Because we had a good day Friday, it was a good week. But we weren't scheduled to come home till Monday. And Sunday in Vegas, I was sitting there with a buddy and we're at Caesars and we said, we looked at each other and go, we gotta get home. It's come, it's come Sunday and um, talking with Tom and we, we decided, you know, it's something, something's not right. It just didn't feel right. 15 minutes before the opening bell on Monday, October 19th, the New York Stock Exchange is bombarded with sell orders. We came in and we were absolutely convinced they were going down. $500 million worth of stocks are sold instantaneously. So on Monday, I come in flat. I have no positions, and the world is in chaos. If you can't buy it, five units are trading, six units, and seven units are trading, eight units are trading here. JP with Merrill Lynch coming in by side, all the way up from 95 up to the figure of five. Stocks open 10% lower than Friday's close. Everybody wanted to sell. So that meant some well-known companies couldn't even open for trading for hours. Exxon, the world's biggest oil company, didn't begin trading for nearly two hours after the stock exchange opened. IBM was an hour and 15 minutes late. Shares of Walt Disney couldn't even begin trading until 11, 12 a.m. It all hinged on New York Stock Exchange. I mean, in today's world, we have electronic trading, so we don't rely on any one exchange for that. But back in 1987, it was all done manually through the specialist system, and there was really no other way to get those stocks open. Market opens at 8.30. We never really get to trade because we go through an opening rotation at that time. It wasn't all electronic or anything like that. We actually had to go through the strikes line by line by line. They had never done this before. It was taking, it would take a half an hour to do just one like one call. But um, we were all complaining, and then and then probably an hour into the trading day, everything reversed. Two opening rotations, and brokers were just saying, make me a market. They didn't care what it was, they said, just make me a market. We were quadruple wide or triple wide, meaning that the markets, you know, uh, could be like $5 wide or something like that. It was, and let me tell you something, guys weren't making markets. I mean, everybody standing in the pit was making a market, but sometimes the broker didn't want to hear the market that they were given. I mean, we were stressed operationally, we were stressed everywhere. There were no automated execution systems. People trading stock against their options positions would talk to a clerk who would hand signal to a post to trade stock. They were swamped. 25 years ago, buying a stock was not an instantaneous process. A customer would begin with a phone call to his or her stockbroker. The broker would take the request and pass it to the firm's trading desk. A call is then made to the brokerage firm's booth clerk on the floor of the exchange. The clerk writes down the order and passes it to the firm's floor broker. The broker then walks to the trading post where the stock trades. There, the broker finds the specialist who finally executes the customer's order. However, for those with access to the technology, the process is as simple as the click of a button. On Monday morning in New York, thousands of computer programs are triggered 
selling billions of dollars in stock from around the world. The, the sound of the dot machine sounded like a machine gun, particularly when volume ratcheted up. Everybody had to liquidate anything. There was a panic going on, and if you had an asset, it had to be sold. So that, while gold was a flight to safety on Friday, it was liquidated on Monday. By 10 a.m., sell orders had reached $1 billion. Computers on the exchange floors could not compete with those of the arbitragers. Program selling taken to the ultimate art form as Wall Street's very biggest players stepped in and unloaded multi-billion dollar blocks of shares. Once again, we're figure even bid here now. Oh, I've caught 10 bucks wide. Figure even bid here now, guys. Once again, figure bid at 05. Oh, even bid, that's an 1100 bid at 05 even off. We have five trade. Seven evens are trading. Guys, once again here, guys, seven even tired trading. Look at the VIX up to 38. Seven even bid here now, guys, once again, seven even bid here now. The volume of orders overwhelms Wall Street's machines. There were institutional orders coming in, sell 10,000 shares of XYZ and sell it now. And any time you heard sell it now, it set off a, a brain wave in you that said, oh my golly, if it's 10,000 out of this person, what's coming behind it? So there was a lot of fear and trepidation. Remember, if you trade in the OX bit, there's no, there's no hedge. So the only hedge was the S&P 500 pit at the CME. And the S&P 500 pit, the markets were like $100 wide. The OEX relied on the New York Stock Exchange. And when the New York Stock Exchange wasn't orderly, the OEX couldn't open in an orderly fashion. The designated order turnaround system on the New York Stock Exchange stalls repeatedly throughout the day. Everything was a nightmare. I mean, I had spent years and years as a broker prior to this, so I had a lot of um, feeling for my friends that were brokers. Um, they had stacks of paper this high that orders that they were trying to get filled. None of the electronic systems were working. Nothing was up and running. Everything was, it was just a disaster. It was a total disaster. 112 million shares are lost in the system. Four hours after the opening bell, there's pandemonium on the floor. 1.30, seeing people crying, running out of the pits, it was eye-opening. It was, it was scary. Pulling traders out of the crowd, yelling, you know, you know, I need to know what's going on, I need to know what your positions are, and it was like chaos. It was almost like a civil war kind of, you know, kind of outlook there, that, that's how I felt. There was never any let up. There was a constant barrage of selling. Everybody was in panic. The world was in panic. And um, whether you were in the stock market or not, you wanted to sell something, anything. And that was the kind of moment it was. Any hope of buy programs to rescue the market is gone. Traders who have been scrambling nonstop across the exchange floor are near exhaustion. Two o'clock in the afternoon, there was a little bit of a bounce and everybody started to think, is this the bottom? It wasn't. The seven hour massacre ends with the Dow finishing down an inconceivable 508 points, five times greater than the record set on the previous Friday. To the end, market analysts are steadfastly refusing to even mention that word crash to describe what's going on right now. Instead, they like to look at it as a correction that still has to work itself out. The market loses 22.6% of its value in one day, twice the percentage than any previous day in history, including the crash of 1929, the day that prompted the Great Depression. Once the bell rang at four o'clock, they couldn't get out. Uh, the backlog was really basically people like yourself, individual investors, who said, gee, I put in an order at three o'clock to sell this stock. Did I sell my stock? I haven't gotten a report yet. I want to know how I stand. I remember at the end of the day, I sat down in the pit. My legs were shaking. I'm sweating profusely. And I'm freaking out at, when am I going to have a job the next day? Are these trades gonna clear up? Is this gonna cost me anything financially? Is, is this business over with? Is the world coming to an end? I saw two grown men leave the pit crying, literally in tears. They had, knew they had lost everything at that point. Big rumors about what's going on, the government's going broke, the, you know, we're about to experience another depression. 
I mean, really, it was crazy. I've never seen the panic level like I saw it that day. It's one of those days where, you know, you know, it's like somebody said, what days you remember? My mom said, you know, Kennedy when he was, I mean, you go through the list, and I know my list, and I was a little young when Kennedy was killed, so I don't remember that one. Uh, but this is one, you know, for sure. One of the things that really sticks in my head at, after the close on Monday was, you know, a lot of the guys were holding their heads on the stairs, but one of the guys I, I knew, because he stood there for a while, he was actually crying. You know, he lost everything. When the bloodbath is over, over $500 billion of capital vanishes in a single day. There were some who managed to prosper amidst the financial wreckage. 33-year-old Paul Tudor Jones capitalized on the chaos of Black Monday to the tune of nearly $200 million. But for most, Wall Street was a disaster area. It was like you were living in a, in a house with a lot of security and a great big foundation. Okay, and all of a sudden an earthquake hit. Okay, and then everything just crumbled. And now you're out on the street with nowhere to live. You no, know, we had to keep our money at a clearing firm. They were in trouble, they wouldn't let you take any money out. And I mean, basically, my, not that it was a huge net worth, I was a pretty young guy at the time, but your entire net worth kind of was in that trading account. I go to the bank, just like everybody else, because there's a line of about 15 of us there. And I wanted my money in cash. I didn't want a cashier's check or anything else like that because the banking system is done. You give me a cashier's check to a bank that's not solvent, what am I gonna do with it? I wanted cash. I stayed there until 7.30 at night with about a half a dozen other guys. We never got our cash. Uh, if I remember correctly, I left about six o'clock. I stopped at a famous Chicago hot dog stand, the Wiener Circle on my way home because I lived near the Wiener Circle because I was like, I just had to get back to normalcy. So I stopped at the Winter Circle, got like a burger or a dog, whatever it was, and nobody there cared. Like not one person was talking about the markets. So I realized, you know what? This must just be isolated to my little world. So I got my burger, whatever. That was my, that was my happy idea and went home. Across the Atlantic, future UK Prime Minister Tony Blair was doing his best to quell fears of a financial panic. Well, I don't think panic's ever a very good idea and certainly not at a time like this. I also think that it is true to say that the very particular collapse we've had over the last couple of days can't be a reflection of any real economic factors. But I think the real problem that we're left with, that anything that happens in Wall Street then reverberates right around the world. When I returned to the office, which was around midnight Chicago time, my uh, uh, assistant handed me the largest um, largest stack of telephone calls I've ever seen in my life. It was like this, you know, those little pink slips that <laughs> record a call like this. The top one was Alan Greenspan. He had had three calls on top. He asked me the critical question. Will you open in the morning? next day we were we couldn't sleep at all I went back to the exchange the next morning at you know whatever two in the morning there was 50 people there you know two three in the morning it was jammed we never opened pretty much the next day anyway we were going through opening rotation for the next like you know day specialists on the New York Stock Exchange no longer have capital to buy stock if the panic selling continues they beg their bankers for money but are denied called my friendly bank and I called the woman on the phone and I said to her, I said, I think I'm going to need $50 million to pay for the inventory uh, that we acquire today in, in the stock market decline. And you could hear this dead silence. If specialists are unable to operate, a collapse in the financial system around the world is certain. The orders were such a deluge that the specialist system, I'm afraid to say it, but it's true, fail. Because the specialists weren't going to take this kind of hit. They didn't have the money for this kind of hit. Before the opening on Tuesday, the Federal Reserve releases a statement. 
and they called the banks and said, you've got to loan these market makers the money so they can pay for these positions. Before the start of trading, the CME Clearinghouse collects margin payments from members to cover Monday's losses. Because two CME Clearinghouse members had not received payments, fears emerged about the solvency of the CME. On the SIBO floor, normally you hear this really loud, it's open outcry. So you hear this huge amount of noise nonstop, everybody screaming. This was just arguing. Everybody was arguing about prices. That, it was just arguing about what price we should open. In New York, two thirds of the specialist's $3 billion of buying power had vanished. Before the market opens, New York Stock Exchange Chairman John Phelan imposes a moratorium on computer trading. market opens. Seven percent of stocks are closed for trading. Imbalances make it impossible for specialists to maintain orderly markets. The call basically went out for buyers and you would hold up trading in a stock if it was going to open dramatically lower. The Fed stopgap measures kick in. The Dow shoots up 126 points in the opening minutes. And they opened up like almost limit. They skyrocketed up on the opening. But the crisis is far from over. What happened is all the put buyers came in and bought puts. Now, I'm standing in the S&P 500 option pit. We're one of the designated primary market makers. We had a position on that was short major market index and long S&P 500 futures. By midday, 10 Dow stocks, accounting for more than half the weight of the Dow, are not open for trading. So the banks were getting extra credit uh, for whatever they needed. And the specialists too, but the specialists were afraid to use it because there was no bottom in sight. And so if there were no buyers, what are they gonna use this, <laughs> this money that they're gonna have to pay back uh, someday when, when <laughs> it was like throwing it out. The role of a specialist was, is to stand there and provide match buyer and seller. And when buyer and seller aren't there to provide liquidity so the, the, the price swings don't get too, too wide for refusing to buy stock from incoming sellers. Some specialists are not acting as the buyer of last resort. But yes, buyer of last resort, and yes, realizing that the stock exchange and the SEC were the regulators of last resort as well, and they were gonna be all over us if we didn't perform. We really couldn't trade. Positions or no positions, good amount of capital or not, it didn't matter, they were Panicked. At that time, the rumors of the, that in fact, the market was gonna close, that New York was gonna close, and more we heard that the Chicago Mercantile was gonna close. The New York Stock Exchange, the heart of the world financial markets, was about to stop beating. I think that would have sent a very, very bad message to not only public, uh, but institutional investors, that if you can't keep the marketplace open, it'll be even worse the, day, the next day, the day after, the day after that. So I think the idea was, was keep the exchange open, rotate around as they do in the options markets and, and other markets, and see how many stocks you could keep open and keep trading and see if they'd stabilize. The Fed's strategy has failed. There is an absence of buy orders. You're frustrated the whole day because, I'll, I'll explain why, because you're standing there on one side of the pit and on the other side of the pit, they open up some puts that are $200 higher than they should be and you're willing to pay, you're willing to sell them $100 or $200 lower and you can't get any of them. The clearing houses would not let you trade. They were, the fires that they had to put out were so big that if you were, have, if you had no position, and you were not one of their problems, they didn't want you to be one of their problems. Thursday, it felt like we were out of business. Like it felt like they were just gonna shut the exchange down because there was no business. The fear spreads to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The market, just like in New York, kept going down and down. And I, I didn't know how and when or whether it would stop. The New York specialists widened their markets to the point where I saw stocks that were $40 bid offered at 50. But we're open, what would you like to do? Well, as someone comes in, a broker comes in and says, I'd like to buy these 40 calls, our question back to them was, which is rude to answer a question with a question, was, 
what's the market? What, where is the stock trading? You tell me where the stock is, I'll tell you what the options are worth. So to me, I was pretty scared that this thing looks like it's melting down. And that would mean that at the CME, if we're still open, we're going to go to zero. We're going to go to zero. If we go to zero, it's the end of the world and we'll be blamed for being zero. It was quiet. It was quiet on the SIBO floor too, but there was a lot of arguing about prices. So I needed a respite while the New York Stock Exchange is making the decision. I was on the phone around noon with John Phelan, and he said to me, he just finished talking to the president, and they are considering closing the market. So I tell the firm, I said, send somebody over to the library to find out what has happened on previous trading halts. And we have 19 people in the firm. We're at war, and I'm telling the, our firm to send somebody over to the library. At 11.15, the Merck is shut down. MMI futures already at historical lows plunge even further when options trading at the CBOE is halted. A few blocks away, the Chicago Board of Trade is still open. Here, MMI futures contracts are being traded. Finally, so the rumors persist. It's 1030, it's quarter 11. I say, finally I say, be long on the halt. We want to be long on the halt, the, the better what? On the New York Stock Exchange, specialists demand that the entire exchange close and reopen 500 points lower. And the reason a lot of the stocks weren't open is because they couldn't find buyers. The specialists had bought all they were willing to buy or able to buy based on whatever their capital was. And the fear was once you halt the market, which was unprecedented, that the market could drop and go, you know, another 1929 here. And the market was closed for about an hour and a half. So there was no broker taking independent business in the major market index that mirrored the Dow. So I personally had to go over and trade in that, in that pit. With the New York Stock Exchange braced to shut down, the Chicago Board of Trade stands defiant. A broker realizes I'm the only buyer in the pit. There are 20 people. I'm the only guy that has, to, has a tendency that I will buy something. At the Chicago Board of Trade, a rise in the MMI creates the most incredible rally in the history of the financial markets. You're always a buyer and always a seller. There's always a place you buy and sell. So I tell them 285. I mean, it's just traded 290. They're trading, there's maybe a 288 bid, but they know that's not really real. So I give them a 285 bid. He says, you own them. And I go, mm -hmm. <laughs> They trade, I think they trade 287. 288, 289, he says, I'll sell you another 50. I buy another 50 at, at uh, 285. They trade 290, 295, and that was, that occurred three minutes after the Merck had, had shut down trading, that, tra that trade occurred. So what happens the rest of the day, it just goes straight up. With an influx of 150 contracts in the major market index, the MMI rises. Since the MMI is so thinly traded, it soars from a discount of 60 points to a premium of 12 points. Or if the stock was at a discount, which was what happened in this case, they could buy the stocks and they could sell the futures. At the time, the MMI is the only major index still trading. With each point representing about five points in the Dow, this was the equivalent of a 360-point rise in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It reaches a point where a huge profit could be made if the Dow stocks they represent are available for purchase on the New York Stock Exchange. And that caused the stocks to reopen because suddenly there were buyers. All eyes in New York noticed the rally in Chicago. Traders demand to buy the Dow stocks that are represented in the MMI. If I know that the, the stocks, the MMI stocks, are trading at a 60-point discount to the future, I'm buying stocks and selling futures until that relationship comes back into line. It's free money if you have the guts, the capital, and the ability to make those trades. Specialist firms relent. They remain open for trading. A furious rally ignites, catapulting the Dow skyward. And suddenly the buyers came in. Companies were announcing buybacks. There was a dramatic number of announcements out of corporations who thought their stocks were ridiculously cheap. 
announcing buybacks, and that probably had a fairly good impact as well. By day's end, the Dow posts a record 102-point gain. The crash of 87 comes to an end. Euphoric. The mood was euphoric. The mood was, gee, I can wipe my brow and I'll live to play another day. And I've kept my candy store open and I've done what I was supposed to do. Missiles were down and then all of a sudden a big buyer comes in. Starts shooting them right back up. It was like euphoria had hit the floor. Everyone's like, oh my God, this isn't a crash. There are buyers here. We found the level. And it was a complete, it was like the entire emotion of the pit changed as one within a five minute span. I was the only person in the firm that had access. I had the badge, the full Board of Trade badge. I used it on the CBOE. I didn't really use it on the Board of Trade, but I was the only person in the firm that was fully qualified. If we had not had myself on that badge and we had been trading as a customer, we could not have executed our orders on that day. And history would have been changed. On October 20th, 1987, at 11.23 a.m., a market meltdown was averted with the purchase of 150 MMI contracts. The rumors were even more prolific after Tuesday when everybody was trying to figure out who the buyer of last resort really was. Was it the Fed coming in? Was it some major bank coming in? Was it some bright individual mutual fund that came in and said, this is the place where I'm going to stand up and commit my capital? We knew there'd be a lot of finger pointing and that we were in for a battle of our lives in terms of were we the bad guys or the fall guys. Or not, but at least we knew that the world didn't end. Our staff on the Board of Trade floor said that Blair had gone in, and we weren't ever sure if it was Blair or one of Blair's traders, which ultimately I found it was Blair, um, had gone in and started uh, buying uh, missile futures. I was in the right place at the right time. I provided liquidity made an offer that was probably, uh, I, I bid, that was probably not too rational. Maybe for some other reasons that I felt that we, um, on a halt, if they are gonna halt, this is a good buying time. Blair, Blair was the man I believe who came in and said, here's the level, went on to run one of the most successful trading firms there was, obviously a brilliant guy, saw the value, went and bought it, turned out to be beautiful, but it was just amazing how you could see hope sort of come back to people. It's like, all right, let's trade. It's time to have some fun. Things kind of stabilize a little bit. We actually start rallying into the rest of the week. That seat that I bought for $260,000 is now back to $360,000 in a couple, a couple of weeks, and it never sees that price again uh, for about uh, 15 years or so. Markets are very different today. We live today in an incredibly efficient marketplace with a ridiculous amount of cash. Remember, it took a few billion dollars to move, to basically move the stock market crash. I mean, today, you know, today Apple moves more in 15 minutes and nobody blinks. And I think that with size and with quantity comes some kind of control. It's much harder to move a market that's bigger. It's like anything else. You have a, a rowboat, you can turn it on a dime. You have a steamship, it takes a while to get it to turn. The advancement of technology has dramatically changed the world for today's traders. I'm always curious with all the electronic technology we have today, how would it have been if we had that technology then? Would it have been smoother? Would it have been e easier? We have such a big, broad, deep market. Computers have made it so that Everybody can trade now. You know, people talk about electronic trading and computers are making so many decisions, but we can see what happens when computers either don't work correctly or they get turned off. 
and people turn their black boxes off, all of a sudden you start losing liquidity, and when you lose liquidity, you could have a meltdown. And in the good old days, you know, you thought about a 30-second execution as being a marvelous execution. The broker could get the order, come to the post, transact, go back and report it to his customer. Gee, 30 seconds, long time, right, in the greater scheme of things. I think markets are efficient. You know, the volatility is controlled. Markets are efficient. I, I, don't, I don't lose sleep at night thinking the markets are going to crash tomorrow. How did it happen? We just dismissed the fact that it could, there could be a 20% gap in volatility could go like that. And we didn't dismiss that after that. The lasting effect of the crash of 87 was the introduction of volatility skew when pricing options. Skew takes into account the increase in volatility when the market falls versus the decrease in volatility when the market rises. So we have this, this change in this, what is called skew in the option market. And it was prior to 87, there wasn't a, there wasn't a skew in, 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 the, in the implied prices. And now there is a skew in, in almost every market. So the crash of 87 taught a lesson to the marketplace. The, crash, the mini crash of 89 reinforced that. And after that, we've always traded with a skew. I wish I had known that we should have a skew back prior to 87. It would have been nice. I don't know why anybody has any fear of getting the markets. I mean, the markets have, have pure context around risk and nothing else in life does. So I feel so much more confident in the, the, the markets because they're so efficient, because they're so tight, that I can actually come up with statistical validation or statistical proof of, what's, of what my risk is, as opposed to you know, the rest of your life when you don't really know anything.